evening, everyone. I'm Michael from Hopkinton Drug, and uh, welcome to our, our fifth annual uh, lecture series this year, and happy holidays to everybody. The way the lecture runs this evening and in this lecture season is that um, we start a little early. Usually it's been at 7, but 6.30. Um, um, Hopkinton Drug, our company, gives a short presentation for 10 or 15 minutes or so. Uh, over the years, we've, we've been asked to do that, so this year uh, we're doing it. And um, it's going to be presented uh, tonight by Vera Parker, one of our um, uh, PharmDs. She's a pharmacist and also uh, a vitamin and nutritional consultant with our company. And uh, without me continuing to talk further, I'd like to bring her up and then she'll introduce Dr. Zarella when she's finished. But thank you for coming, Vera Parker. Good evening, everybody. Um, so I'm Vera, and um, I'm just going to try and give a short pre-presentation about four nutrients that tend to be most significant for bone health. Um, there are, of course, more factors than these, but um, if any of you were to hazard a guess, I bet you can guess at least three out of these four, which would be the most important nutrients for bone health. Any, any volunteers? Calcium. Calcium. Vitamin D. Vitamin D, yep. Magnesium. And then, did you get it? K. K, that's right. OK, so you guys got all of them. Um, and I'm just going to go over this. I thought it would be a nice little topic since bone health and dental health are tied together, bones and teeth being made of the same minerals. All right. So you already guessed which ones we're talking about. I'm just going to go over the role of each and some dietary sources for you. So um, calcium is a major building block of both bones and teeth, which are composed of calcium phosphate. Most of the calcium in the body is in the skeleton and the teeth. Um, so what the calcium does, it provides strength and hardness to bones and teeth. Um, and going along with that, if you don't have enough calcium staying in your bones, they get soft or brittle, um, and that can lead to problems. Um, calcium does have other roles in the body too, but we're just going over bones and teeth. Um, recommendations now are, and this includes in the diet as well as in supplements, um, for most adults it's a thousand milligrams per day. Um, when you get to be older, for women over 50 and for men over 70, they're recommending 1200 milligrams per day. Um, so the best way to get your calcium is from food. The classic thing everyone thinks of is milk. Um, that's not the only food source. Um, you can also get it from green vegetables. You can get it from fortified foods like cereal, orange juice, tofu, um, most nutritional beverages or baby formula will have some. Um, and this is usually a safer way to absorb it since you're not getting a huge load all dumped at once. Um, if you get it from supplements, you can only absorb about 500 milligrams at a time. So for people who are trying to take 1,000 milligrams a day as a supplement, you would want to divide that dose. Um, so the most common form you'll see in a calcium supplement is calcium carbonate. Um, it's usually not expensive, it's widely available, but it's, I wouldn't say it's the best form. Um, it's basically the same as the mineral limestone. So it's not the easiest thing for the body to digest. You have to have food with it. Calcium citrate, um, like in citricale, for example, um, that's the form that you don't necessarily have to have a meal with. Um, but there's also all sorts of calcium that's incorporated in food-based vitamins and supplements. Um, you can get chelated calcium, uh, which usually means it's bound to an amino acid. Um, and anytime you're supplementing with calcium, you do have to be careful that you don't get too much. It is possible to get kidney stones or to get uh, mineralization of blood vessels, which you don't want. And that's partly where some of these other nutrients come into play. So both vitamin D and vitamin K support calcium absorption and they help it to go where it needs to go. Vitamin D is necessary for the gut to actually absorb uh, calcium from the diet. 
um, but it also helps balance the amount of calcium that stays in the blood um, and it's needed for normal bone growth and remodeling. Deficiency in vitamin D causes rickets um, or osteomalacia. Rickets is typically what it's called when it happens in children who maybe have been kept indoors and they can have you know, bone malformations. In grown-ups, um, you can develop osteoporosis, you can develop brittle bones, um, and that's because you're just not absorbing calcium without the vitamin D. It has other functions in the body as well. It actually, the, vi the term vitamin D is a bit of a misnomer because it is actually a hormone. Uh, vitamin K acts on a lot of proteins in the body, and most people know about those proteins that are involved with blood clotting, um, but there are also some important ones involved with um, calcium mineralization in the body. Um, one of those is GLA matrix protein, um, which that's found in the smooth muscle and blood vessels, and it's also found in bone matrix. Um, there's also osteocalcin in bone matrix. And when vitamin K is present, what it does is tend to have calcium not accumulate in blood vessel walls. So that's you know, protective for the heart. If you're taking calcium, you don't want it going near your blood vessels and hardening your arteries. Um, but it also helps it to be attracted to bone um, where you want your calcium to go. So there's a lot of controversy about vitamin D. Um, several, you know, kind of important um, scientific bodies actually don't even agree about how much vitamin D is enough. Um, and, you know, part of the whole concern about supplementation is because it's very difficult to get this vitamin from your diet. So it's a huge, obviously a huge opportunity for supplementation, um, but we don't want anyone to get too carried away. There's actually some major studies ongoing now, finally, that there's one by Harvard funded by NIH um, that should start to have results in about two years where people are being supplemented with 2,000 units a day of vitamin D, looking for health effects. Um, but for right now, you, what the recommended daily allowances are for almost people is 600 units a day and then 800 units a day for those 70 and older. Um, the Endocrine Society and the International Osteoporosis Foundation um, both s don't really agree with those generally accepted guidelines um, that were kind of came about from the Institute of Medicine's most recent um, collection. Um, they would say that a lot of people do need a thousand to two thousand units a day, and if you know those of you who know about vitamin D supplementation, um, you probably are aware that a lot of people take a lot more than that. People who have an overt deficiency will often need you know five thousand to ten thousand units a day at least for a while to correct the deficiency. Um, there is even disagreement about vitamin D testing for blood levels. Um, what gets tested is 25-hydroxy vitamin D, which is a long-acting metabolite of vitamin D. It sticks around for about 15 days. So that gives you a good picture of how much vitamin D there is um, available in your blood. And, you know, some the I guess the traditional approach was you only need 20 nanograms per milliliter. Now it's kind of most doctors will say 30 nanograms per milliliter, but levels up to 100 are, are considered acceptable, and some practitioners will say, you know, they want it to be closer to that. Um, but with vitamin D, as with calcium, there can be side effects mostly associated with absorbing too much calcium. So kind of the same sort of thing, kidney stones are possible if you take too much of it. Um, vitamin D is another thing. It'd be great if we could get it from food, but it's not that realistic compared to calcium. Um, the best sources are usually fish and liver, although you can get small amounts of it from shiitake mushrooms, for example, and some from eggs. Um, you can get some from sunlight, um, and people who spend a lot of time in the sun without sunscreen can um, you know, actually have pretty adequate levels just from that alone but that's becoming less and less common um, due to fears of skin cancer and also in areas, you know, northern latitudes like this, obviously, we're not getting sun exposure this time of year. Um, 
There's lots of different supplements forms available, capsules, tablets, um, liquid forms, and it's often in combination with calcium, vitamin K, or other nutrients for bone health. Um, I commonly get people asking me about vitamin D3 versus D2. Um, and they're just two different forms of the vitamin. D3 is close to the active form in the body, and that's usually what your over-the-counter vitamins will have in it. D2 is made a different way. Um, they are considered to be about the same, but at high doses, it's possible to absorb more D3 than D2. The only form of D2 that's really even used is a high-dose prescription form, so um, that's probably why they choose to use it that way. Vitamin K, you can see a lot of different sources. Um, people worry about vitamin K intake because it's you know pretty widely known that if you're on blood thinners, you have to be careful with it. But a common misconception is whether it causes um, increased blood clotting for everybody, and in fact, it doesn't. It will only do that if you're taking a blood thinner called warfarin or Coumadin. Um, and that's because the way that medicine works is by blocking the effects of vitamin K. Um, so for food sources, leafy greens are big, vegetables, um, some vegetable oils, and believe it or not, the bacteria that already live in your intestinal tract do produce some vitamin K as well. Um, so it's often given with vitamin D. Um, it is a fat-soluble vitamin, so like vitamin D, it's best taken with food. Um, and there's actually no upper dose limit established um, for this particular vitamin. The only caveat being if you're on warfarin, you wouldn't take it. Uh, magnesium is the other one. Magnesium and calcium are pretty closely interrelated. Both are minerals found in bone and magnesium does regulate the activity of vitamin D. Um, it also influences um, parathyroid hormone, and both uh, that and vitamin D are involved in the homeostasis of calcium in the body. So um, in addition to bone and teeth, magnesium is involved in muscle and nerve health. Um, and recently there has been some sort of newer evidence that at least in postmenopausal women, a higher intake of magnesium is associated with a higher bone mineral density, which would be protective against osteoporosis. Um, magnesium intake is somewhat low in a lot of people in this country. Um, so that's another thing that people don't always know. So sometimes um, it's good to have it in a supplement um, it's commonly in a lot of the same supplements that you'll find calcium in um, or a basic multivitamin. Um, and the recommended intakes vary a lot by age and gender, but it's usually around 300 to 400 milligrams per day. So the best food source of magnesium is actually almonds. It's also found in cashews and peanuts. Um, you can get it in some legumes, whole grains, um, yogurt, spinach. Um, and if you go into the supplement side of things, um, there are a ton of forms of magnesium. This is a huge source of confusion at the pharmacy sometimes, which one is the best one to take, you know, what's going to cause less stomach upset. Um, some of you may know that magnesium is also used as an antacid uh, and as a laxative, so people with stomach complaints may take it for that reason. Um, but since it does tend to have laxative properties at higher doses, that's something that limits the amount that people can take as a supplement. Um, so I'm going to be available after the presentation if any of you have any questions. And um, it's my pleasure to introduce one of the great local dentists from Ashland, Dr. John Zarella, and he will be with you shortly. Thank you, Dr. Vera Parker. Thank you so much. Hello, how's everybody doing today? Excellent. Thank you so much for coming tonight. So I am Dr. John Zarella. I'm a uh, family dentist uh, locally here in Ashland. And I provide a full range of services for people of all ages. So from little kids age one, up to big kids age 90, and everybody in between. So I've been practicing for 28 years, 
And I have something to share tonight. I know Vera has covered some material that I'll actually be adding to because nutrition and vitamins is so important to our health. So thank you for bringing that to, uh, to tonight's uh, presentation. So, so who am I and why am I here? So it's important for you to get to know who I am because it relates to what I want in the end of this presentation is for you to go home and to change your life. You really want to have this create something different in your life. And in order for that to make sense, you have to know something about me. And the thing that I want you to know is that it starts with thinking differently. Can everybody hear me? Excellent, good. So thinking differently about your health care. So if I want you to think differently, I have to be one that has thought differently in the way I practice. So as you learn how I am doing my dental practice, it may be a little different. But it's the way that we need to think to be the healthiest that we can be. And that's what's so important. So sharing this information with you, I'm hoping that you're going to share it with other people. And then we just get our community healthier and healthier. And using a pharmacy like Hopkinton Drug and having Vera be a part of your healthcare team is what it's all about, is surrounding yourself with valuable people. It's not just one person. And we're going to get into that a little bit. So you're going to learn a little bit about me. So who am I? I believe in and practice a brand of dental care that relates to and promotes overall health. So it's your whole body. So it's not just up here. This affects down here and down here affects up here. And more and more we're seeing that people, dentists, professionals are really grabbing onto this and realizing how important it is. But it's not something new. There are people from years ago that have had this knowledge, but we're just starting to realize how important it is and how it's changing people's lives. I had a patient today, she's 90 years old. She's in perfect health. She is unbelievable. And she said to me, and my hygienist who's sitting here tonight, she said, people need to know how to live their life better when they're a kid. And the way we eat and the things that we do, we need to get exercise and move around. This woman is so vibrant. She is in better shape and has more going on upstairs than most people that I've seen in their 50s and 60s. So it has to do with what she's talking about. Okay, and this is changing the way we do things. So this presentation is really all about through me getting to know how to make this change. So we're going to look at um, a little bit of, a, of an outline. So what we're going to talk about is basically your health and my health and how there's a link between what happens with oral health and how that relates to our overall health and our general overall health can be affected by chronic inflammation. So we're going to re relate something dental to something in our body. And it's through a process of chronic inflammation. And one of the things that nutrition does is it helps to battle chronic inflammation. So that's why it's a big piece and we're going to touch base on that. So before we get started, I know we've all had a long day. So I want everybody to stand up. And we're going to get some blood back in our brains. Everybody okay with that? All right, good. So, just pretty much, just stretch up here. Get your hands up in the air. Excellent. Thank you very much. Okay, stamp on the ground. Beautiful, okay. This is going to be some places for you to look. It'll always be there. I'll be verbally going over things. People learn differently. Some people want to learn visually. Some people want to learn with their ears, okay. If you want to learn three-dimensionally, you can go to the person next to you, look in their mouth, put your fingers in there. No, I'm only kidding. Don't do that. But you can look at your neighbor, say hi, and you're going to help each other. Okay? So thank you very much. The next thing is in the back of the room, some of my staff are going to be there. So make sure that when you're filling out your survey forms for Hopkinton Drug and for myself, 
We're going to collect them. If for some reason you still have it on your way out, make sure you drop it off. That is so important for us because we are asking your opinion. We want to know what you think and what you feel. Okay, so everybody can have a seat again. Thank you so much. Give yourself a hand. <laughs> Very good. Okay. If I say something or use a word that doesn't make sense, I want you to stop me and ask. There will be questions at the end for basic questions. This is going to be if the thing that I just said doesn't make sense. Okay, or you don't understand what that word means and stop me right away. Okay, and there's a microphone that Greg is going to use and he's going to come over to you so he, he can hear your question. Okay, and then we'll answer that right away. Other basic questions we'll save to the end. Okay, we'll have plenty of time for that. And... I think that's all the announcements I need to make about that. Excellent. Everybody's okay with that? Good. Because we don't want things to get confusing. Because what will happen is if you go past something that's get a little bit kind of fuzzy, you'll start to get a little bit more further away, further away, and pretty soon it will seem like everything's in a cloud. Okay? It will just get too confusing, and at the end you'll get really tired. So we don't want that to happen. We want you to stay energized with this. Okay? So a little bit more about me. I was trained at Boston University Dental School in Boston, uh, better known as the Henry Goldman School of Graduate Dentistry. Dr. Goldman, Henry Goldman, was a periodontist. He's one of the first people to discover that bacteria in your mouth cause you to lose your teeth, okay, cause gum disease. So he was one of the pioneers that realized that if we could just get rid of that, we could save our teeth, which also meant that we we're going to be healthier. So that's very important. You're going to hear a common theme going on here. I've also had some specialty training after dental school at the Panky Institute for Advanced Education, okay? And then the International Periodontal Symposium, the Spear Group Study Club, Tufts Dental School for Pain Management, TMJ, TMD, you've probably heard some of these words, headaches, neck aches, muscle referred pain, and sleep disorders. Why is that important? Just real quick, how about headaches? Most people, a lot of women, who get regular headaches, most of these headaches are tension headaches, some of them are migraines. Did you know that most of these types of headaches can be prevented if you see a dentist that's trained in how to do that? Okay, it's pretty amazing that these things can be derived from a dental problem. Okay, so if we understand pain management, and we can help a patient dentally, we're also going to help them with other things that we'll go over later. It will make a little bit more sense. And how about sleep disorders? Okay, so we're going to go into dentally how that relates to you and how that relates to your overall health and chronic inflammation. I've also received special academic awards in periodontics. Can everybody guess what we're going to be talking about in terms of dental problems? Hey, all right. Thank you. Excellent. So my goal and purpose, for me, it all starts with really caring, and I mean really caring about the person in front of me. And this is how you choose your healthcare professionals. So you have to be very, very sure that the person that you're going to is really taking the time to listen to you. That's what healthcare should be. It's really taking the time and being interested in the person in front of you. So you have these choices. I believe in surrounding yourself with a team. You have your primary care, you have your dentist, you have a pharmacist, okay, that can help you with nutrition. There are alternative care specialists. Is anybody in here in that profession? Alternative care specialists, chiropractors, acupuncturists, cranial sacral therapists, alpha biotics, ever hear of these things? Okay, excellent. So I believe in that, and I believe that that helps us become even healthier. And it looks past that mainstream medical mentality, which is needed at times, but we also have to think beyond that in order to stay as healthy as we can. So this is the foundation of who I am and how I feel and think. And then this presentation will build on that and also provide awareness, because it's all about giving knowledge to everyone and helping more people in the community. So you are going to help with that, that we're spreading the word out. So my goal at the end of this is for you to think differently, 
to encourage you to demand the highest level of care, no matter who you go to, and to be smarter when it comes to your health care choices. Is that okay with you? Does that sound pretty good? Okay, good. So what makes our practice and brand of dentistry a little unique Zarella Dentistry is kind of a brand. It's, it's thinking about what do we want to provide people? What's the direction that we want to go when we're giving care? And just to kind of put it in a, uh, a little capsule, we call it say ah. So you know when you go to the doctor and they put the tongue depressor there and you ah, okay? So we have this saying, say ah. It starts with striving for optimum health for our community by choosing your health care providers that are also in line with that. They have to believe in that as well as you. And match your individual health goals, whether it's traditional medicine or alternative health care like we talked about, and dental health care. So you're building this team. I am so supportive of this group effort, this group effect of using other people, alternative medicine, to help this model, this team approach model. And we're going to talk about the say ah mentality. I'm just going to read. This happens to be off my reception wall in my office. This is the whole wall. Okay, so this is how much I believe in this. Now this is specific for me, so I'm going to read it a little different. By choosing your dentist that believes that oral health and overall health are linked, you have taken the first step to preventing diseases throughout the body by keeping a healthy mouth a clean mouth is the key to a healthy body. So let your dental team be your first line of defense. Okay, and we're going to learn what that means. So by choosing a dentist that provides this philosophy that a clean, healthy mouth is truly the key to a healthier body, and then seeing that dentist is truly taking the first step to preventing diseases throughout the body. And so why is this the first line of defense? So I'm going to go over that in just a second. So how many of you are interested in having longevity and let's, let's call it um, sustainability for your oral health as well as your overall health? Would that sound interesting for you, have longevity and sustainability, okay? The dentists that believe in this are usually the ones that also be believe in treating patients in a comprehensive style of care, okay? So what that means, when you're treating somebody comprehensively, if you come in and your tooth broke, and the dentist looks at it and says, oh, you broke your tooth, okay, let's fix it. Let's put a filling back in. Well, let's put a crown in, maybe you broke too much. So he's taking care of the problem. That's it, you're done, right? No. Right. So what did the dentist really do, or the doctor? They treated your symptom. It's like giving you a prescription. Go away. Okay? Well, it's good to take care of the problem. But what caused the problem? What caused the tooth to break? Teeth don't just break. Okay? But if you come in and your tooth broke, we have to figure out why that happened. So if we're thinking comprehensively, we're looking at the big picture, we're standing back and saying, okay, I'm going to fix the tooth, but first I'm going to find out why did it happen, because I want to fix that so that this tooth doesn't break again, or that another tooth doesn't break. That's an example of how to look at things comprehensively, not just the problem that just happened, okay? So when we look at treating the whole body, we're looking at also a comprehensive style of dentistry. So we're looking at the cause of the problem, not just treating the symptom. So now we're going to look at another image that has to do with how things in our mouth affect our, our whole body. Now, you're not going to be able to see all the little words up here, but this is in your, um, your package. So everybody should have a package, a, a, a folder from Hopkinton Drug. And if you didn't get this, raise your hand and I'll have somebody hand it out to you. Does anybody need this? You need it. Okay, right there in the front. <laughs> and we have Vera, she's got one. Everybody have one? Okay. So I'm just going to read a few things on this, but you get to take this home. So gum disease increases the risk of head and neck cancer from the American Academy of Oral Systemic Health. That's pretty alarming. 
Did anybody know that? I'm a dentist and we're just starting to realize this. Bacteria in your mouth travel to other parts of your body in the bloodstream. Diabetes and bleeding gums increase your risk of premature death by 400 to 700 percent. Pregnant women with gum disease, this, this doesn't have to relate to the aging population. This has to relate to everybody. So when you go home, you're going to talk to your family about this. Okay? Pregnant women with gum disease have only one in seven chance of giving birth to a healthy child of normal size. That's if they have gum disease. People with gum disease are twice as likely to die from heart disease and three times as likely to die from stroke. That's from the Mayo Clinic. Tooth loss and gum disease increase the risk of Alzheimer's disease. It's from the Mayo Clinic. Gum disease increases pancreatic and kidney cancer risk by 62% from a Harvard study. The Surgeon General reports that at least 80% of American adults have gum disease. So it's pretty unbelievable evidence scientifically that gum disease is causing a lot of health problems. Okay? So if you're a surgeon and you're going to do open heart surgery and your arteries are being clogged from bacteria from the mouth, what are your expectations for the results afterwards? Is this person going to heal? Are they going to recuperate? Are they going to get healthier? Are they going to stay healthy? If this stuff is feeding this problem, why not fix this and then do the surgery? That would make more sense. Well, some doctors are starting to feel that way. So we're going to go over that a little bit later. Everybody doing okay so far? Okay. So let's see. So to get into the gum disease and overall health, first we have to define a few things. The only way this works is that the dentist and the dental team have to really believe in this and think differently and optimize health care, not only for ourselves, but for the community. So that's why I'm here. I want to spread this out for knowledge in the community. And so does it almost sound like this is starting to come together? The changes, being a different dentist, thinking differently, having the medical community, community think differently, involving a team of health care providers. Does it sound like it's starting to gel in a little bit? Okay, good. So what is gingivitis? You've all heard of this. It's an infection in our gums. It's causing gums to be red, purple, puffy, edematous. The gums bleed easily when we have slight pressure on them, and they're more tender when we have them cleaned. So what causes it? Well, our mouths are full of bacteria. Some are good, some are bad, and there's a balance. If we let the bacteria stay there too long, we interrupt the balance. The bad bacteria start to rise, and they overcome the good bacteria, and they start to cause disease. So certain bacteria that damage our gums are different than other bacteria in our mouth. Like some of them damage our teeth. They cause cavities. They're two different bacteria. So bacteria are always found in the mouth, good and bad. Periodontitis is an infection of all the supporting structures of the mouth, including the gums, the oral, soft tissue, the bone that surrounds our teeth. So it's everything. And bad bacteria get under the gums, and they start munching away at the bone when they get too deep. So your dentist is, or should be checking to see if you have spaces under your gums called pockets, and they measure those. And if they do that, they usually count out numbers, one, two, three, five, six, whatever it is, and you may feel a little pinch when they're doing that. This is one of the most important pieces of information for them to understand if you have gum disease. Okay? Because we have to find that to be able to understand how to treat it so that we can help your body be healthier. So this bacteria is munching away at your bone. Then what happens? It releases toxins and they get pussy. So there's pus coming out of your gums in these deep pockets. Okay? Does that sound pretty good? Right. Not good at all. And then it creates horrible breath. Okay, this is not your coffee breath or your smoking breath. This is really distinct. This is somebody you know is coming down the hall, three cubicles away. Okay, this is periodontal disease. Okay, now this person's already embarrassed. People are trying to get away from them. 
doesn't have to be that way. You good? Thank you. It doesn't have to be that way. Okay, this is very treatable. So help this person. Put a little note on the desk and say, when's the last time you went to a dentist? Or maybe have a quick conversation. They would, they would send you flowers, the fact that you cared so much to say that, and to avoid them, right? But just say maybe, you know, when's the last time you went to the dentist? Has it been a while? It's like, you know what? I can tell because I can tell that your breath's a little different, okay? <laughs> All right? They know it. There's no surprise to them. They understand. But they are so embarrassed, they don't know what to do about it. So go see your dentist. It's, has it been a while? Just ask them, when's the last time you went to the dentist and had your teeth cleaned? Maybe you should go back. I think that would help. Okay? You just created this huge help and helped this person be more alive. Okay? So it's, it's an end result of, of infection, all that pus being in the gums. And then what happens? I got, our teeth get loose, and eventually they have to be extracted. So for everybody sitting here, you have either parents, grandparents, or great-grandparents that lost their teeth and had to have dentures. And 70 to 80% of the people that lost their teeth in that generation lost their teeth because of periodontal disease. Okay? So both of these, gingivitis and periodontitis, are both infections. Our body's immune system is activated to fight both gingivitis and periodontitis to get rid of it. To do this, our immune system creates a sequence of events that create inflammation. This is another word that you're going to hear a lot about in terms of health. If our gum disease is ongoing, it doesn't seem to get better. Every time we go, we're having the hygienist tell us that we have gingivitis, that we have bleeding gums, that we have maybe some form of periodontitis. That's chronic. It's happening over and over and over again. So how does this affect our overall health? Well, okay, so think about gingivitis, periodontitis as bacteria. They're getting your, your gums to be all red and inflamed and puffy. That's edema, okay? So your body's fighting an infection. It's producing byproducts, which make the gum a little puffy. You get a little cut in your hand, you get that little bump on it, it's a little tender to touch. The same thing happens in your gums. So your blood vessels are engorged, they're wide open in these capillary beds. That's how we get nutrition, that's how we give off things. So this is all puffy, those capillary beds are wide open, the bacteria are easily getting into the bloodstream. All the time. So these bad bacteria getting in the bloodstream right away flooding your whole body because your circulation system is bringing it everywhere. It's going to your heart. Your heart pumps it to the rest of your body. What's it doing to your heart? These are the exact same bacteria in gum disease, the same exact bacteria that clog the arteries, arteriosclerosis, that are giving you a heart attack, having bypass surgery. Okay? It's the exact same bacteria. So they're going to our organs all the time and they're creating inflammation in our body. See? We're getting there. Okay. So now let's look at what inflammation is. So first let's look at acute inflammation. Acute inflammation is good. It prevents the spread of infection. This is what happens when we get a cold, when we cut ourselves, so we just get a little splinter in our skin. It sets off an immune response, a cascade of events, which allow the body to heal the damaged tissue, to repair it, and to get rid of the toxins. It's triggered by an acute tissue injury or infection. There's four signs of acute inflammation, redness, pain, heat, or swelling. So remember the gums. They're red, they're puffy, they hurt a little bit when you touch it, and they're swelling. So when the hygienist says your gums are whatever, not that healthy, don't be offended. Be glad that they said that because they're going to help you get rid of that because that is inflammation, which is from an infection. So what is it our body does to fight infection or injury? It has to create this inflammatory reaction. If this process lasts for more than two weeks, do you know what it's called? Chronic. chronic. Exactly. It's chronic inflammation. The person will have less symptoms. I'm going to say that again. This person will have less symptoms when they have chronic inflammation. 
you won't even know it's there. How important is that? There's no alarms going off. There's no thing to say, oh, I've got to go get to the doctor. You don't even know it's there anymore. How serious is that? That's the worst, right? Because we have no knowledge that we're having a problem. And a persistent, exaggerated immune response happening over and over, leading to chronic disease. Does periodontal disease hurt? Anybody know? Is it painful to have periodontal disease? No. Gum no. disease? No. It's a chronic inflammation with persistent, exaggerated, inflammatory response. It has no pain. You're, you're in the chronic stage. Okay? It's not an acute stage. Everybody getting this? Is this okay? You with me? All right. Of the 10 leading causes of death in the United States, chronic low-level inflammation contributes to the pathology of at least seven. How alarming is that? What other diseases associated with chronic inflammation? Cancer, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, heart attack, stroke, arthritis, Alzheimer's disease, pulmonary disease, that's long, autoimmune diseases like lupus and neurologic diseases. Does anybody here know of anybody that has any of those? Just a few? So, yes? Microphone. Thanks, Elizabeth. She's my office manager. Does that mean that it always... Um, uh, contributes to those uh, every time, and that's what causes it, the um, inflammation in the mouth? Inflammation. Um, I'm not a researcher. I'm not a physician. But there's so much evidence that chronic inflammation will lead to this eventually in most people. It's just like, you know, somebody who smoked all their life and they don't get any cancer, they don't get lung cancer, they're fine. It's like, that's a rare case. That's just something, that's an aberration, okay? So most of the time, there's so much science behind this that most of the time, chronic inflammation will lead to some general body disease. Chronic inflammation, in particular, of the mouth. Well, the, the, it's, it's a place of where do you get the infection from. So this, chronically, if we have gum disease chronically, so we're constantly fueling our body with inflammation, okay? So it's a source, it's a big source of a supply of infection that keeps the inflammation going. There's other ones we're going to get into, but that's a big one. Okay, but thank you for the question. Anybody else about what we just talked about? All right, good. All right, so now we're going to make the connection. So let's say you have your parents or your children have chronic gingivitis or gum disease. It's triggering the immune system to stay on all the time and we just learned that this leads to some serious diseases later in life. So it's not that it selects the aging population. It's just that as you do this over and over over the years from when you're a kid, by the time you get older, now you're being hit with the end result of that, which is the diseases they're finding. Okay? That's the end result of the chronic inflammation going on in our bodies all the time. So what happens is that it's releasing products, this ongoing cascade of events is releasing products in our system that become toxic to our organs and affecting their function. Chronic inflammation leads to chemical transmitter kinases that turn on NFKB that produces gene transcription, don't go to sleep on me, that produces more pro-inflammatory molecules. I just put this up there, not for that to make sense, but what I want you to get from that slide is that it proves that there is science behind this. That this inflammation is actually scientifically being shown to cause your genes in your cells to change, to become something else. And that something else is usually something that's not good for us. Okay, And that's how things start to get in awry and our organs start to not work properly.
So it goes right to the cell structure and rearranges our genes that become diseased. Does that make sense? Can people see this? Okay. So the inflammation, the chronic inflammation is causing the cells to actually change. Is that something that's hereditary that you could pass on to your children? So certainly the way our body in each of us is going to react to certain things can be hereditary. So you want to look at your gene pool, your health history. What happened to your parents? What happened to your grandparents? What did they die of? Did they have their teeth? Were they healthy? Did they have healthy teeth? Did they not have healthy teeth? This is going to help you put things in place. So use the knowledge. It doesn't mean that you'll get that because now you can make changes. So use that information from your lineage and use that to help not let you go down that same road because, again, this is all preventable. Okay, thank you so much for that question. Cytokines are chemical messengers that are released in our blood stream and can both increase and decrease the inflammatory pathway. So there's a good and a bad effect in the short and long-term release, acute or chronic. Okay, so let's say we have the acute problem and we want to have an inflammatory response. That's good, we're going to clean up the mess. So we want to create inflammation. But then there's also ones that stop it. And we have to have both, and we want to have the ones that stop it because we don't want it to keep going on and on. And we're going to go over that in just a second. If we get an increase in beta amyloid in our system that is found in Alzheimer's disease, that's a result of chronic inflammation. So how else can we create chronic inflammation? One of the ways is sleep disorders, okay? Sleep disorders affects a very high percentage of the population. Our immune system function is intrinsically tied to our sleep-wake cycle. Even a single night of partial sleep deprivation results in rises of inflammatory markers that turn off our ability to reduce inflammation. So in other words, we need sleep to turn it off. So when you go into that deep sleep, the, um, that deep REM4 sleep, that's when our body's repaired. That's when we produce the anti-inflammatory markers that shut it off, shut the system off, okay? There are a lot of people that don't sleep well. They have sleep apnea, they have some sleep disorder, okay? And they're not getting that full REM sleep enough to produce the anti-inflammatory markers, so there's nothing turning it off, okay? And how does this relate to dentistry? Well, about 98% of the population grinds or clenches their teeth while sleeping that interrupts their stage four sleep. Did you know this? Okay. Anybody that has sleep apnea, by definition, should be wearing a bite guard because that's going to help them sleep better. Okay. Because if you don't sleep well, you're going to clench and grind your teeth more. It's like a reaction. It's like a reflex. And if we clench and grind more while we're sleeping, it interrupts our sleep. Because this muscle activity to do that will wake us up. Not enough that we know that we're awake, but it wakes us out of the deep sleep, the deep stage four sleep, okay? So just from clenching and grinding is going to stop us from producing the anti-inflammatory markers that are going to stop inflammation, let alone if we have another type of sleep disorder. So seeing a dentist that's trained in this can help 98% of the population get a better night's sleep just from helping them with grinding and clenching, okay? So that's a, a huge amount of the population that we can help. I evaluate this in all of my patients when I do a comprehensive exam. I take study models and I look for all types of signs. I take photographs of teeth that we can find and, and absolutely identify anybody that has some amount of grinding, clenching, bruxing that they could be doing during the day or at night because this affects so much of our health and our ability to stay healthy, keep our teeth healthy, and keep our body healthy. Other factors for chronic inflammation are stress. Stressful thoughts alone can trigger this inflammatory response. Stress releases cortisone, which helps increase pro-inflammatory markers. So we, you're making more inflammation. Anyone here have any stress in their life? Okay. So again, part of your team could be, maybe you're going to involve some yoga. Maybe do some breathing exercises. 
go to a gym, whatever it is, but we need to release stress. Another one is anti-inflammatory drugs, corticosteroids like prednisone that shut down the chronic inflammation that's hurting your body. So in other words, if you need to take that medication because it's trying to help you from something, at some point you need to come off of it. They don't want you on it that long because there's horrible side effects. But I think of it this way. If you shut off inflammation, well, that's helping you with one part. But what happens if you get an injury? You need inflammation. You need to protect your body. But you're not going to get it because you just shut it off with this drug. You shut off the whole pathway of creating inflammation. So it's very dangerous. So the whole point is finding out why did I need to take this drug to shut off the immune system, to shut off the anti-inflammatory system. So you have to find out what, what was the reason behind that I needed to do this. Get to the source of the problem. How about sedentary lifestyle? Okay, like we got up and we stretched, we moved around. Did you know that we spend an average of 9.3 hours a day sitting? That's amazing. So, sedentary lifestyles can create type 2 diabetes, heart disease, depression, and a cluster of diseases that are mediated by inflammation. And to help this, you've probably heard this maybe from your doctors, that we should walk about 10,000 steps a day. Anybody hear this? You got that? Anybody have a bracelet that keeps track of how many steps you take? Do you have one? No? Greg, do you have one? No. <laughs> so it's a good idea. We, we need to get out there. We need to move. Okay? We sit too much, and that creates uh, inflammation. How about our diet? Like Vera was saying before. The American diet. You think it's good? No. It's horrible. It is so horrible. So when, when we have kids and, they're, and, and you have grandkids, okay, and they're going to McDonald's and they're eating processed food, lots of sugar, you're just giving them everything they need to be unhealthy later in life. It's horrible. So what's better is maybe a uh, Mediterranean diet, which we have. Um, you can get this anywhere. You can look it up. Basically, you want to eat more fish, seafood, fruits, vegetables, nuts, um, seeds, herbs, you know, green things. Um, they're even tweaking it even more in that end. So this plus getting away from pre-processed foods, cook yourself, cook for yourself, cook good food, okay? That's where it's headed. You know, people in Europe, they go to the market that day. They cook for the day. They don't go and buy groceries for the whole week, okay? They don't have supposedly the best healthcare system in the world, but they're really healthy. Maybe not all of them, but as a, as a group, seem to be a lot healthier than us, okay? It has to do with diet. So, I wanna share with you something tonight that's very, very important. In fact, it's amazing. So before we watch an important video about what we went over tonight, I'd like to share with you a quote. The doctor of the future will give no medicine, but will interest her or his patients in the care of the human frame, in diet, and in the cause and prevention of disease. Anybody know who said that? This was Thomas Edison. Okay, how long ago was that? So remember I said in the beginning that this isn't new. Okay, this guy was pretty smart, right? So he knew from way back then there's something about this. We just, we just didn't listen to it. We, we, didn't, we didn't think of it the way he did. So really, really important information. So what we're going to do now is see this video, the Say Ah video, and then we're going to uh, have some questions after that. Our nation can only be as strong as our health, and we're not 
doing well now. We have twice the chronic disease of Europe and four times that of Mexico, Japan, China, and India. 75% of our medical costs are caused by chronic disease, by things that we can prevent. Only if America stops the influx of chronic disease. Only if each individual stops their own chronic disease. Can we lead in healthcare and can America be a vibrant country with a high standard of living? Within creation of health, we're helping to take a person who is not yet sick, has not developed a problem, and prevent them from ever going down the path to sustaining that illness. So as I'm identifying patients with disease, I would have a subset of patients who I couldn't find a cause for the problem. Well then when I discovered the, the amazingly strong association between mouth disease and the things that I do treat, like blood pressure, diabetes, heart attacks and strokes, even things like pneumonia and a whole long list of systemic diseases that can originate from disease in our mouth, that was another turning point in my career. Once I looked inside the mouth, I found the source of a lot of problems in people who otherwise might not have had their problems identified. The mouth and the rest of the body relate anatomically and uh, functionally, and that's why the oral systemic connection is absolutely inherent in the way we're put together. From a disease standpoint, when we have different situations in the mouth, we respond, our body responds with inflammation, and that's where we start the infl inflammatory cascade that's affecting most of these inflammatory diseases. I want you to think about this. Inflammation, and there's a, there's a concept called inflammatory burden. When you get more inflammation in your system, the accumulation of that will have a tipping point where you tend to have inflammatory disease. Inflammatory diseases are heart attacks, strokes, diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, various cancers, kidney disease, pancreatic cancer, the list goes on and on and on. We're in a state of chronic inflammation and that's the basis for every disease that everyone has. It's the basis for cardiovascular disease, it's the basis for cancer. When you're dealing with periodontal disease, there's this entire inflammatory cascade going on that people don't understand. When you get a cut, for example, okay, your body is set up to heal that cut, and that goes through a process of inflammatory response to, to solve the problem and resolve. If you always have a chronic inflammatory bacterial condition in your mouth, then you never turn off that process of inflammation. In other words, it never gets the opportunity to resolve and go away. There's just too much. The body can't react to all of them, and the body gets sick. Periodontal disease, periodontitis, gum disease, whatever you call it, it all begins with bacteria. Bacteria are microscopic organisms, and in your mouth, there are billions. Over time, these bacteria can stick together and multiply over and over again. They can then form a colony and join together to create a thick layer called a plaque biofilm. Then, over a short period of time, it can dramatically spread throughout all of your mouth, teeth, gums, tongue, cheeks, everywhere. If there's an opening in your bloodstream in your mouth, the harmful bacteria can enter, causing the body many sicknesses. But there is another problem that occurs in response to the bacteria as your body tries to fight back. Inflammatory cells are triggered to try and kill the bacteria. But bacteria build their own strong defenses and battle back. This microscopic war ensues, and the result? Chronic inflammation and inflammation is the basis for so many diseases. So bacteria is basically a foreign organism that comes into our body and attacks our body and causes disease. And that can be picked up from a door handle or I've strangely enough had a couple of patients who have had periodontal disease transmission from their dogs. 
um, from feeding them treats and not washing their hands afterwards and eating or letting their dogs kiss them. So when you were growing up and your mom would say, don't drink after your brother or you know, don't share that popsicle with your friend down the street, you're gonna get germs or go wash your hands. You were just outside and you might have germs. Those germs are the bacteria that then can go into your mouth and set up infection. So we say to the dental patient, you have an infection in your gums. The total area of your gums is about the size of the palm of your hand. If you looked at the palm of your hand and you saw an open wound the size of the palm of your hand, would you just decide not to do anything about it? And yet people are choosing every day not to address the infection in their mouths. People think that it's normal that when they brush their teeth, their gums bleed. And I don't know where they came up with that. If there's a little blood in the sink, it means they've got a problem. The bacteria that cause inflammation in the mouth will typically cause inflammation in the rest of the body. If there's a little inflammation between the teeth, it means that there's a problem where those high-risk bacteria may be getting into their bloodstream and cause any one of the many systemic diseases that can originate from bacteria in the mouth. had a keen interest in the health of the mouth and our work to prevent heart attacks and strokes and that has just intensified as the science has evolved. We now have great science telling us that the cause of arterial disease is inflammation and another source of arterial inflammation is infection in the mouth. With the most recent study coming out, it actually implies up to 50% or more of acute heart attacks are triggered by oral infection. That's huge. Heart attacks are the number one killer in this country. Strokes are the number one cause of disability. The current cost of cardiovascular disease to our healthcare system is about $518 billion and it's all preventable. Inflammation sets up a reaction that causes things in our body that makes us less responsive to insulin, which is how we develop type two diabetes. So whether it is inflammation from just a fat belly whether it's inflammation from gum disease, or whether it's inflammation because you've got a chronic abscess someplace, it causes the same process of a resistance to insulin, which leads to type 2 diabetes, or is the hallmark of type 2 diabetes. Even mild peripheral infections when it occurs in combination with some other secondary infection could cause severe uh, adverse outcomes. And for periodontal disease, it tends to be ignored because it doesn't kill. But I think what we're showing here is periodontal disease does kill because if the bacteria uh, gets into the blood circulation and gets to the uterus, it could kill the baby. They now tell us that half of America has a condition known as periodontal disease. But what it says to me is half the people that now go into surgery have this condition. And we know what can happen with this condition in surgery. The body can only fight infection on so many fronts. And it's like a war. It has a certain amount of resources it can allocate to that fight. And when you have an infection elsewhere in your body, it's allocated resources to that infection site. And then when you go in and do a surgery, you create another wound and that wound demands that the body put attention to it too. So the reason you don't do uh, surgeries on patients who have infections is because it, it diminishes their ability to recover from the surgery and it increases the likelihood that any other bacteria could then take hold because there just aren't enough antibodies to fight that infection. It's clear to see that the inflammatory burden caused by periodontal disease is a serious problem for the mouth of America to get healthier, 
There is a specially trained group of men and women in this country who will have to step forward and provide preventive care. Some refer to them as oral medicine specialists. We know them as the dentist. Now the dentist is looking through a wider scope, a wider viewfinder, and now being a screener, looking at a wider context of treating the whole person versus just the mouth. And we're not saying dentists are gonna replace medicine. No, they're now partners with, and they are the first line of defense because the mouth is that first indicator. And check this out, nine out of 10 patients who go to a dental office do not have a primary care physician on the medical history form. The public, government, insurance, caregivers, and even dentists themselves have to begin to think of dentistry as part of the first line of defense against disease and sickness. The distinction between the standard dentist and a complete health dentist is extremely important. The standard dentist does a good job of taking care of teeth in the mouth, but a complete health dentist focuses not only on care of teeth and the mouth, but also cares for the complete health of the individual. I know we're going to make some vast changes in people's lives for the better. We're going to save a lot of lives. We're going to improve a lot of health. We're going to save a lot of health care costs. And I have no doubt that the world will be a better place because of all the work all of these passionate individuals are doing. There doesn't have to be any one hero. There just has to be a whole lot of heroes working together. One of the keys in everyone getting healthy is decreasing inflammation. And the most powerful thing we know about decreasing inflammation is taking care of your gums. And dentistry has a key role in that. So what do you think? Wow, right? Now, is that thinking differently? Big time, okay? So again, is the dentist thinking differently? When we saw this, we were on board right away because we were already in, in that line. But we didn't know that there were doctors, physicians who were also thinking the same thing. So we've joined this coalition. This is what we need. We need to just keep spreading this over and over and having that transmit out to people just asking for it, okay? Making sure that that's out there. So how many of you are willing to share this with your friends, family, or coworkers, this information? Excellent. Thank you. So that's the whole point is getting the information out. Like she said, there's no one hero. It's all of us taking a role in this. It's important to get this out into the public's hands and their minds and for you to expect it. See, that's the thing is we should expect this. We should demand this. This is for us. It's for our health. We're not just interested in mediocre health. Okay, just wait in a line. The doctor sees you for two seconds and hands your prescription. That's not okay. All right, we demand better than that. So before we go to questions, could you please fill out the uh, lecture evaluations for both um, myself and for the Hopkinton drug, and then someone will be around to pick them up. If anybody's willing and wants to uh, stay, do a quick 30-second um, video testimonial that we can put out there in the electronic world, you know, um, that would be great. It would really be nice to have uh, a face and, and a voice, um, you know, be out there on uh, Twitter. So I'd like to thank Hopkinton uh, Drug for uh, having me be here. Hopkinton Drug is unbelievable. Um, they have helped me so much with my patients because there are a lot of oral problems that we get, oral infections, that they themselves have um, very custom made uh, rinses that we can use so patients are more comfortable, they're antibacterials. Uh, I have a product that they compound for me. It's very, very specific. Do you know how many people, um, there's a very high percentage, I don't know how many people in the room, that when you have your teeth cleaned, their teeth are very, very sensitive. Like you almost can't stand it, like your teeth are just really sensitive for the cleaning. Okay, I have a lot of patients, my wife's one of them, okay, just very sensitive. So they have a product that we use that's a numbing effect. And we just paint it on their teeth with a Q-tip. And it is so great and so numbing that they talk as if they were numb because that's how much it's making their mouth numb. And they are just ecstatic that they can sit there and do a cleaning and not be uncomfortable. So Hopkinton Drug has helped me out many times with those kinds of personal effects and uh, compounding effects. Uh, so as you're filling out the survey, does anybody have, uh, uh, my office manager Elizabeth is there, and Greg, and uh, they're there to help pick up anything, or again, if you have any questions, they'll be happy to ask uh, or answer those questions. And is there anybody here that has any general questions? Yes. Um, I get my teeth cleaned twice a year. 
<laughs> that's, that's a, you don't have to be that close to it. <laughs> yeah. And I thought at one point my gums were receding a little bit. And, yes. and I said to the hygienist, you know, they're receding. And she said, well, it's an age thing a little bit. Is that true? <laughs> that's an excellent question. You know, I'm so glad you brought that up. Um, part of periodontal disease is looking at infection causing bone loss. Remember I said the bacteria is munching away, producing pus. You're losing bone, your teeth get loose, and you have to extract them, OK? There's only two ways you can lose bone. It has to be the bacteria, which is gum disease. And, and that's why the dentist has to check for that, or the hygienist. But it can also be from trauma. So if you have recession, and you have no periodontal disease, and your numbers are good, ones, twos, or threes, then you're not losing, that's losing bone when you have recession, OK? It's not related to age, it's just that we see it as you get older because it's been happening earlier, and then you start to see it as you get older, okay? This is one of the most misunderstood and misconceived pieces of dentistry. Even dentists don't really fully understand this, okay, unless they do special training. Remember, I went to a periodontal school. They didn't allow general dentists there when it first opened. It was just surgeons. So when I went there to get my family or general dentistry certificate, they made sure that I understood periodontal disease. Okay? So periodontal disease can cause bone loss that can then, you get recession with it. Okay? But there are patients that have periodontal disease that have no recession. But if you have recession in a healthy mouth and no bacteria that's causing gum disease, then the recession is from trauma. And the way that we get trauma is from clenching and grinding our teeth. Okay, so again, going back to custom bite guards, helping us sleep better, also helps us not lose bone in our jaw, right? Yes? The dentist that I go to um, had said that, and I didn't believe him. At first I was like, I need a night guard? I don't grind my teeth. I've heard so many times that um, I was told that I was brushing too hard. Yeah, right. So I want to bring that up again. It's, again, it's, if you're, if you're, if you're a doctor, and your, your knowledge is based on science, and somebody has something that you can't understand, they go crazy, because they can't identify what it is. So they start to make up stuff. Not on purpose, but it's like they have to explain, why do you have recession? Well, you're brushing too hard. Somehow that makes sense to them, okay? But what the brushing hard does is you have to have recession first, okay? So look at this. Here's your tooth, here's your gum. Your enamel ends here. The rest underneath you is your root surrounded in bone, okay? All of a sudden you get some recession, the distance between here and here, okay? As time goes on, you may get a little more. Now it's a little bit more recession, okay? It went higher, the number's higher, okay? You're brushing too hard. How many times does the dentist say you're brushing too hard, right? Okay? You're grooving out the root. There's no enamel there. It's softer. So we're brushing, brushing. We're brushing away the tooth, and it makes like a notch. You know like a beaver's eating around a tree? That's what it does to your root. So when they look at the recession, they say, oh, you're brushing too hard. Well, they are right, you're brushing too hard, but that's not what caused the recession. That was there first, then your brush made the root wear down. But what caused the recession in the first place? You have to lose bone first. Think about this. Your root is surrounded in bone. If you got recession and there was no bone loss, wouldn't your gum be sliding past your bone? Right? Because there's bone underneath there. So if it was just the gum moving, We'd be exposed bone. We'd be walking around with exposed bone, which would be really painful. That doesn't happen. Because what happens is, the bone has to go away first underneath, and the gum's just following the bone. It's doing what it's supposed to. It has an integrated relationship with the bone when there's lack of infection. And if the bone goes down, the gum follows it, goes down, the gum follows it. So recession is bone loss. Ah, why are we getting bone loss? It's either bacteria or it's trauma. If your mouth is healthy and there's no pockets, and there's no periodontal disease, it's trauma. So where are we getting the trauma from? I, I guess I just didn't realize that at night um, that that was happening because no one had said I, I, I ground my teeth. But it's, he said it was even just clenching. Yes, exactly. Clench is enough. Clenching. To, and I wasn't having a sore jaw or anything either. Right. We don't, we, don't all, we don't all get the same symptoms from clenching and grinding. Okay? When you have... Actually, nobody really realizes that they clench or grind. Most of us don't realize it, okay? I'm a dentist, and I didn't know I was doing it until I went to the Panky Institute and got advanced education, okay? And after I looked at my models and my teeth, and I'm like, oh my God, it's like, this is crazy. 
So all these years, because they don't teach that in dental school. So if you have a dentist that didn't go to get extra training, he's not going to know what to look for in your mouth. Okay? He's not going to take study models and take photographs or do measurements because that's not in his repertoire. He hasn't been trained to do that. Doesn't mean he's a bad dentist, it's just he doesn't have that knowledge yet. Okay? So we clench, we grind all the time chronically, and that will cause damage. And eventually down the road, we see it as either recession or you have a cracked tooth or you broke a tooth or a headache or a neck ache, jaw pain, clicking, popping, all these things that are side effects of the clenching and the grinding that cause our mouth to break down cause inflammation. The muscles are overworking all the time. Can that recession reverse? Ah. With, the, with, the, with the guard? So, what the guard does is it doesn't stop you from clenching or grinding. It's in your central nervous system. It stops the process from causing the damage. That's all it does. It stop, you'll still do it, but it's not going to allow it to cause the damage. Okay. Once you have recession, if you lose too much of that gum that's supposed to be there to anchor it into your bone and your root, if that's too thin, then you may need to do a gum graft. That's when they're taking that same tissue and they're putting it back, okay? But if you don't solve the problem, see the grafts, it's just solving the symptoms. That's good, but what caused that to happen in the first place? The clenching and the grinding, okay? So let's stop that, because otherwise you're gonna need surgery again. Because the graft's gonna go away. So the bone won't come back, but at least you're not going to keep getting worse. Exactly. Right, right. And you should, you know, like if you get it early, you've got plenty of bone, you've got plenty of that surrounding you've got plenty of gum. But a lot of people go many years before somebody realizes it, and then they do need to do a graft. But at least then hopefully somebody's saying, well, you need a bike card, you need to check this and that. And, yeah. We, we sometimes have a pathologic bite, the way our teeth come together. We're born with it. And that's horrible. And then you add all those extra forces, and we're just breaking everything down. And this pathologic bite is going to just constantly be wearing and wearing and breaking down. And muscles in this person is just, an, it's like a train wreck. And then when they come to see me, I look at it and it's like, I have to redo their whole mouth. Because it's so devastating. It affects everything. And if it affects the joint too much, if that breaks down, then our choices may be limited. But they usually can get help. Those are excellent questions. Thank you. Yes. I have pockets of four and five, but I don't have anything like bleeding or soreness or bad breath that I know of. Okay. But do I automatically have periodontal disease because of the pockets themselves? So a great question. So there's different levels of periodontal disease. So just quick, I'm going to go over some of the stages, OK? The, the first is you're pretty healthy. Okay, we didn't even categorize you as a periodontal disease. You're just healthy, okay? You have ones, twos, threes. There's very minimal bleeding. There's just the initial signs of infection. That's good. That's what we want, okay? Then you get a little further along. You have too much gingivitis, but it's not affecting the bone. You're not getting pockets. That's just gingivitis. That's reversible. Clean that up. Come in more often. Get your gums clean. It goes away. It's back to normal. If you keep it in the bacteria too long, the gingivitis leads to bacteria getting under the gum. The tissue starts to separate from the bone. They, they kind of pull apart, and that's how you form the pockets, okay? So you start to eat away at more fibers, get a little deeper, eat away more fibers, they get a little deeper, then you're five millimeters, okay? If you're five millimeters or less, it probably hasn't hit the bone yet. So you're not in the category of periodontal disease that's affecting the bone, you're losing bone. But you're still getting pockets, which is creating bacteria, which is creating a lot of bacteria in your body, and pretty soon it's gonna to lead to the bone. So you're still classified as a periodontal patient and you have to manage those pockets. Okay, you may not need surgery. So there's managing periodontal disease in three ways. Non-surgical, surgical, and extraction. Yeah, that's the last step. That's too late. Okay, so we wanna manage it non-surgical, surgical, and try to keep you from extraction. So you're in an environment which is doable, okay, you just have to keep track of it. You have to go back regular because you can't let those fives go higher. And you actually want them to shrink. You don't want to walk around with fives. Can you shrink it? Can By cleaning the bacteria out, the gums will shrink on their own. Mm -hmm. Okay? Depending on where the bone is. If your bone levels are too up and down, then you've got a bone problem. And then sometimes the gum surgeon has to level that out. 
right? It's like putting your comforter over the bed. If you've got lumps on it, the comforter is going to look like it has lumps. It can't lay flat. So you can't let the gum be up here and have the bone be all like this. So if you have some areas where there is true bone loss, you're getting some of the bacteria eating away at your bone, then usually the surgeon has to trim that away. He has to cut away the disease and move the gum to that point. So he's getting rid of the pocket. He's actually pushing the gum towards the bone, which is good because we can manage on our own the gum that's one, two, or three millimeters above. That's something we can do. But if it's five or six, we can't manage that. Our, our brush is up here, our floss is up here, and we have to be down here. That's too deep of a distance, okay? So you have to be more closely monitored by your dentist and your hygienist, but you really want to try to get away from having fives. Yeah. Excellent question. Okay. I yes. Have a question. Um, do I have just microphone? Just hold it. My grandfather had um, dentures top and bottom, and he was born like 1900. And I realize now. When I was around five, he already had the dentures, so he must have lost all his teeth by 55. Was that like a periodontal thing or just fillings he couldn't afford to have filled? Like, what could cause that? Yeah, you know, years ago, people really didn't go to the dentist on a regular basis. And the knowledge of periodontal disease didn't exist. Remember, Henry Goldman started at the dental school in Boston, you know? So this, this wasn't around way back. And people weren't going regularly. Whether they couldn't afford it, they just didn't know. The knowledge wasn't there. So what happens is, even at a young age, you can lose your teeth to the periodontal disease. Because if the bacteria stay there, and they're underneath the gum, and they're just eating away, eating away, before you know it, especially genetically, if you don't have that ability to kind of clean yourself up. Like some people, their bodies just can fight it, but fight it and fight it, and they don't, they don't get as bad. Okay? We've had some patients haven't had their teeth cleaned in 10 years. They come in, it's perfect. <laughs> Okay? But that's like one in like every 10 years, you know what I mean? Yeah. But the rest of us will break down and we will have a lot of disease, okay? So, you know, back then they weren't going regularly to have the bacteria removed, so it's building up and the teeth are losing bone and the foundation's gone. And the pus gets in there and then pretty soon they're having to have them, you know, extracted over dentures. So most of the people back then was because of periodontal disease, okay? You know, bacteria are also eating away at our teeth. So yeah, there are some teeth that are going to get so fragile because there's so much, you know, decay in there and big fillings that they're going to break. Yeah. But you know, some of those can be repaired and restored. But again, to have the teeth have to be extracted, most of the time it was due to bone loss. Yeah. Anybody else have any periodontal questions? Yes. I have a question about TMJ. Yes. Um, so out of nowhere this past summer, my, the left side of my jaw started clicking. Yes. And every time I open and close my mouth, especially to chew, click, 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 drive me crazy. And then just went away one day. Right. So I thought I was home free. And now, uh, about a month ago, I developed um, <coughs> sort of this little pain in my jaw, but it more feels like it's in my ear. Mm -hmm and behind my ear and this nerve that goes down the back of my neck. I went to see uh, a doctor because I had an earache, basically. Correct. So I'm sticking antibiotics in my ear. But I notice when I push on the side of my jaw, the ear pain goes away. So I guess my question is, is, is this, does this come and go and resolve itself? Is, is it something that lasts a lifetime and is there any intervention needed at this time for it? Excellent, thank you for the question. Um, a piece of that is related to tonight, but that could be a, a whole other lecture series. And there's a, a place in your forms that can say, uh, you can write in, what would you want me to talk about if we did another lecture? What are the things you're interested in? So TMJ problems, I mean, that's a whole, I mean, you could spend a whole day on that. But just to quickly answer that, did your doctor that saw your ear, did he say that he, yes, identified that you had an infection in your ear? Now, to, to your point earlier, he gave me the medication all in five minutes and see you later. Right. So you probably didn't get the right diagnosis. Yeah, I didn't have an ear infection. He Correct. Said, but, but if you were putting enough. antibiotics in, then that's crazy. Because okay. if you haven't identified as a true infection, now you're making the bacteria resistant. So don't over medicate with antibiotics. So what was probably happening to you is you were getting an acute TMJ problem, which is a result of, get this, 
clenching and grinding. Okay? So one of the most misdiagnosed problems because dentists aren't trained for this. We have to decide to go back and get extra training on our own and pay for it. Okay, so we have to stay away from our office, not treat patients, be away for week after week after week. That's a lot of training. Not everybody's going to volunteer for that. So not everybody's getting trained to know and understand TMJ problems, bite problems, grinding and clenching. So what happens is when you're clenching and grinding over and over and over again, how many push-ups can you do? <laughs> 10, 15, 20, 30? Okay. And then after you did that, I said, okay, get on to another 30. Would you be able to do it? You'd fatigue, right? And eventually you wouldn't be able to do even one. You wouldn't be able to get off the floor. You'd be so exhausted, okay? Use this muscle over and over and over, day and night, all the time. Don't you think it gets fatigued? But we still can open our jaw, but it's sore when we open, right? And it goes up to our ear. So what's happening is the muscle is so angry. It's building up lactic acid. There's no blood getting in. There's no oxygen getting in. It is so, I've had a patient come in, the cheek out to here. Just looking at them, they said they have an infection, right? Probably an abscess tooth. Cheeks out to here. We do our test, and I said, ooh, I don't think this is an infection. I don't even think it's a tooth problem. This woman was clenching so much that her muscle was so tight. So when we, right? Your muscle gets tight when you, when you overwork it, right? It gets big. This muscle was so angry and so tight it had a ball. Okay, it made, her, it made her look like she had an infection. And we made an initial diagnosis that she was clenching. So we gave her like a test bite guard, like you could throw it away. After the first night of wearing it, she was 40% better. The second night, she was 80% better. I was like, I think I'm on the right track, <laughs> right? Okay, and we made her a custom bite guard. And after that, maybe 2% of her pain was a tooth problem. But this much of her pain was from the muscle. The muscle was so angry. It was referring pain to her teeth, making it look like it was a tooth problem. It was making the muscle overwork, so it was fatigue, getting no blood. And then the muscle refers pain. It refers the pain to your teeth, to your ear, to your neck, to your head. You get a headache, you get a neck ache. I had a woman that worked for me. I did her exam. I did the comprehensive exam. And I said, you really need to wear a custom bike car. And she said, okay, nobody's ever told me that. It's fine. I said, dentists are all trained differently. And she said, I've been waking up every morning with a neck ache for most of my life, at least the last 25, 30 years. I said, did you do anything? She goes, I got a new pillow, new mattress, change this, change that. Never, never made it better. Every morning she'd wake up with a neck ache. So I said, I can't guarantee I'm going to get rid of it because I don't, I don't know enough about it. We have an injury, you, know, you had a car accident, I don't know. But I know you need a bike car, and that could help you. So she wore it for one night, came in the next day, I said, how'd you do? She's like, good. I said, how was your neck? She goes, no neck ache. I said, really? Interesting. Next night, she comes in. I said, how'd you do? Now she's mad. She says, how come nobody told me about this? She says, you mean I had to live for 25 years with this and a dentist could have helped me? I said, oh, only a dentist is trained to know how to help you with that. I said, but no neck ache, right? She says, no. It was just because of grinding and clenching. For 25 years, she's been putting up with this. I had a woman the other day wore a bike guard for maybe a week and said to us, that is the first night's sleep or first week that I've had a full sleep in like forever, like since she's known. It helped her sleep better, like we talked about earlier. Just been wearing a bike guard for a couple of nights. So you're triggering all this cascade of events because you're overworking the muscle and it's feeding injury to the joint. So you're clicking and popping as a result of the muscle overworking, okay? So there's a little pillow that separates your skull from the jaw, okay? And that little pillow is meant to go with the jaw as it's moving and you're talking and you're chewing. But it's also moved by a muscle. So if that muscle is overworked and punching all the time, it actually gets pushed out of place. It should be here and it gets pushed out of the way. So when you open, it clicks. And when you close, hopefully it clicks again. That's better, okay? Actually, sorry, that's not better. That's worse, because that's being pushed out again. It's better if it clicks once and doesn't click again. Now, what happens if the click goes away? Does that mean you cure? Actually, it's the worst that's happened. You probably dislocated the disc. It's never going back. So it's not gonna click, but your jaw's not gonna open straight. You're not gonna be able to open all the way. That's another event of it breaking down more and more and more. So you should probably wear a bite guard, get some muscle therapy, Maybe you know, look for some nutrition, okay, to help balance. 
but it's it's a end result of uh, clenching and the grinding. Anybody else have any questions? Yes, sir. Yes. Yes. Has that been that way for many years, hundred years, or thousand years, where something has changed to increase that? Uh, that's excellent. 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 You know, he, he's starting to think, and that's what this whole thing is about: is to think differently. People have been clenching and grinding for probably a number of years, but what I've seen and what my colleagues have seen more recently is that the damage is more noticeable more recently because it's more, it's more, uh, let's say we all clench and grind to a certain degree, it's chronic. We don't notice it, everything's great, we go through life, and maybe we get a little recession. Okay, that's not bad. Right? Maybe once in a while we get a headache from it. No big deal. But things are slowly breaking down. Okay? And at some point, maybe we get the click, the pop. Maybe it leads to another problem. Okay? But what we're finding more recently is that people are under so much stress. Right? We're overworking. We have too much stuff going on. We're always connected. Right? That we're under so much stress that instead of this being this little chronic amount, it's acute. The volume goes up. So now we're breaking things. It's more noticeable. We have pain. We have headaches. I've had a, a, a periodontist that I work with, and he said, in the last two years alone, they have had to pull more teeth due to cracked, broken teeth from clenching and grinding than in their whole career. So I think the answer is, yeah, we've probably always been doing it to some degree, but because of our lifestyle, it's brought us up to a volume of being more aggressive, and it's causing more damage. Yes. Did that, did that answer? Excellent. Now, somebody else back here had a question? Yes. Um, my husband, who's sitting right here, but won't ask the question. It's okay. <laughs> uh, he had hip surgery, and he had a hip replacement, and he has to take antibiotics every yes. time he goes to the dentist. I want your comment on that. That's right. So why do you need to do that? Okay, so... Correct, okay. So years ago, they decided that they wanted people to pre-medicate with an antibiotic if they had certain conditions. One of them could have been a, uh, a heart, a little skip in your heart, called mitral valve prolapse, systolic click, okay? And they felt that the valve, which was defective, wouldn't close all the way, would be prone to bacterial growth. The problem is they could never really prove that taking the antibiotic would stop that from happening, would actually help it. And then what they found is that there's so many people becoming resistant to antibiotics that they had to decide if there was no scientific proof that that was actually helping, then we probably shouldn't do it because we're, we're getting too immune to the, the bacteria getting too immune. So the change then came recently that if you had a joint replacement, that normally you would have to pre-medicate for the first year or two, three years, and then you didn't have to do it. But now they're saying that you probably should do it your whole life. And then the more recent change said, nah, maybe not. <laughs> Again, they're just looking at the evidence and they're starting to make changes. What it's come down to is, besides that initial part of healing, like that first year to three years, after that, it's up to the surgeon because you may have a complication that's specific that maybe increases your risk where you didn't. So you have to talk to your surgeon and say, say it's been after three years, should I still pre-medicate? And it's up to them to make the call because they know what happened during the surgery. Was there a complication? Is there something going on that makes you more prone? But they do still believe that bacteria in your mouth can go into your joint and cause a, an infection that's gonna make you lose your artificial joint. They stopped it for two or three years and you start it up again. <laughs> See, again, I mean, for me personally, yeah. I would go to the surgeon always to make the call. Even if, even if the literature is coming to me and say, you don't have to do it anymore, I would still go to the surgeon and say, it's up to you to make the final call. But for the other things like mitral valve prolapse, we don't have to do it anymore. Thank you. Is that okay? okay? All right. Anybody else? Yes, sir. I was going to ask you a question, uh, which is about... It, it's exciting to hear you talk about comprehensive care, looking to the total body health, but that takes a lot of time. Not always. And, you know, how do you run your practice where you have to spend so much time with the individual to say, 
oh, you know, what are you taking? Do you take supplements? Do you do this? Do you this? How, how, how do you encompass that all in and then, you know, make money, I guess, in the end of the day? Excellent question. Well, the first thing that has is the dentist himself has to decide what kind of practice he wants. Okay? Do you want to be, you know, a gerbil in a, in a cage and running 8,000 miles an hour? Okay? There's plenty of offices that are like that, and they see, maybe a dentist can see 30 patients a day, okay, and you're on roller skates. Are you getting quality care? Maybe. But if you're seeing 30 patients a day and you're doing a crown and it takes you normally an hour, an hour and a half to do that crown properly, and now you have to do it in 15 minutes because you're running on a corporate level of instruction, where's the quality go? So that's why we all have to be better at choosing the team that we use. What is it in value for you? There are some people that love that. I want to be in and out, I don't care. But then I tend to be redoing the work if they didn't take the right amount of time. I'm not saying they're all bad. It has to do with the dentist, the ethics of the dentist and the place they're working for. So for me, I spend my time with the patients. It's very important, the person that's in front of me. I may spend 15 minutes, maybe a half an hour talking about your health history and what experiences you've had. And maybe I don't even have time to look in your mouth and I have to have you come back because it was so important for me to get that information in order to go forward and give you the kind of help and the kind of attention that you need to do the right things, I need to know that history. That's very important. We can't rush over that. So I spend a little extra time. If I see that there's a bigger problem, I may have you come back and do a focused exam to get more information. Like if I'm here and popping and clicking, and you're telling me that you have that same problem that gentleman had. Mm -hmm. Then you're coming back for just an exam on that. Again, that's just a very specific, you, you need a lot of information on that. So it's not that we're, making patients you know, wait a lot of time. We're, we're almost involving them in it so that it's up to them. Is this important to you? Is this something that you want? Is this in the same line of healthcare that you're interested in? And if that is, then we're gonna have a good relationship because you're gonna value the time that I'm gonna spend with you. If not, then what we're trying to do is educate you to say what's available. If you don't want that, I can't force that, but I'm hoping that over time I'll be able to bring you to another level. This is kind of like three levels of dental care. The people that only go when they have an emergency, they don't go regularly. I'm only going to go if I'm in pain, okay? I don't agree with that, okay? And some people, that's their reality, okay? Hopefully we can make them realize that prevention is going to stop that problem from happening and they're not going to have pain and they can save a tooth. There's another group of, of uh, health care that you go regularly, you get your teeth clean, You'll do some basic dentistry, you'll get fillings and things like that, but maybe you're not going to volunteer for the kind of dentistry that will prevent further problems like wearing a bike guard or you know, maybe an advanced amount of gum cleaning, you know, you're not having pain, that's not, you're not interested in that. We'll still try to educate you, but you're not going to do the ultimate best dentistry that can be offered. And then there's the last level where patients are willing to do ultimate, long-term, predictable dentistry where they're taking everything that they can possibly do to make their mouth healthy, make their body healthy. And we can provide that. So it's, it's based on the patient and what they're looking for, how much time we spend, but we always want to give them the opportunity to have the best care possible. Okay. So it starts with a good comprehensive exam. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Anybody else? Yes? Can I have lots of questions? Um, your thoughts on existing root canals and the replacement with dental implants, in particular um, using zirconium versus the use of uh, non-use of metals in the mouth. So say the word again, zirconium? Zirconium. In terms of an implant? Yes. Okay. So um, root canals, when done properly by somebody that's trained to do them properly, are very, very high predictable um, treatment, ex uh, treatment um, uh, uh, success rate. They have a high success rate if they're done properly. If we, didn't, if we couldn't do root canals, a lot of people wouldn't have teeth, okay? Because you'd have to extract them because they have infections. If there's other things going on with the tooth that compromise the case, there's gum disease, there's fractures, there's things that maybe make it less predictable. 
if you do all of those steps, you do a root canal and a post buildup and gum surgery and then put the crown on it, hopefully a bite guard, is that going to last? Is that going to be predictable? And you have to look at the big picture. So now we're starting to change our thought because implants are so predictable that now the decision is do we remove bone to save the tooth and do the root canal and get rid of the gum disease and have a situation that maybe is an optimum, maybe last five years, we're not sure, maybe it'll last longer. Maybe it's better to take the tooth out and do an implant. But there has to be enough reason to do that. It's not just like, oh, you have a choice. You can do a root canal and put a crown on the tooth or do an extraction, do an implant. To me, that's not the way to go because implants have complications. And bone doesn't, you know, implants don't work at all bone types. So you always try to treat with things that are predictable, but you have to look at everything that's going on and have a team. So I'll use a surgeon as part of my team to decide, is this worth it? And some of the decisions that they would normally make years ago where they would do almost uh, heroics to try to save a tooth, they may not do that because they want to preserve bone. And if you don't have to remove bone and you preserve it, then you have a good environment to put an implant in. And implants are very, very successful in the right hands. You have to see somebody that's trained to do this very well and they have lots of experience, okay? So I use very, very, very well-trained, I mean, these, these are surgeons that are some of the best in the country. We're, we're lucky we have them in this area. The materials you use, typically the implant that goes in the bone, so you have a bad root, it's removed, you put an implant root in. It's a good root. It's usually titanium. That's the material that the implant's made of. That's the part that's the root in the bone. The part that's above that, which the restorative dentist like myself can fix, can use a variety of materials. It could be a zirconium abutment. That's the part that's above the gum. It could be metal, it could be titanium, it could be gold. They're all good. Usually the zirconium ones, because they're white, are for front teeth, because you don't want to get a shadow of something dark underneath. So they'll use a zirconium, which goes under the gum, into the implant. So it doesn't bleed through the gum, this kind of grayish kind of, you know, it'll, look, it'll make your gum look a little darker. Okay, and when you smile, if you have a high smile line, your lip goes way up high, you may see that. So you, you start to choose materials that won't give you that look. If your smile line doesn't go up that high, they don't have to worry about it. They can use maybe the thing that's the strongest, even though it's going to maybe give that gum a little bit of a gray tone, you're, not, you're never going to see because your lip doesn't go up that far. So there are lots of very good materials. Zirconia, in terms of a crown, I mean, you can hit it with a hammer, it doesn't break. It's a very, very strong material. It has great biocompatibility with the gum. This is the next generation of ceramics, is zirconium, okay? We use it all the time, it's wonderful. You do have to choose the cases right. If you choose the case where somebody's a heavy grinder or bruxer and they've worn all their teeth down and you're reconstructing, you can use materials that are less likely to break because you, you know, it's the person you're dealing with. They need that protection and always protect them with a the bite guard. But then remember, more people are losing their teeth because of grinding and clenching, because of cracks that are forming. So we put so much force in our teeth, we have fillings there already. They even break without fillings, but that increases it. And you get cracks. These don't hurt. It's like splitting wood. You start at the top, you give it a little tap, it starts to make the wood spread a little bit, you go a little more, a little more, pretty soon it's going down the wood. So I get into your tooth, there's a cavity there, I start drill away, I see a crack. And all of a sudden it goes down below the gum. I can't see it anymore. Sometimes I'll send you to a gum search and I'll say, I don't know if this is worth treating. Because what happens is that that crack keeps going down and I fix it and it's beautiful. And all of a sudden, a year or two years down the road, that crack keeps going down the root. And now all the bacteria get in. You lose it and you lose all your investment. So we're getting very, very good at detecting cracks. And wearing a bike guard is not only stopping that crack from going further down the root, but it's stopping it from happening on your other teeth. It's huge. I have a question. Yes. Um, and I'm asking this because I once got orthotics that never worked and I never got my money back. Is that about your feet? No, 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 oh, no. Okay. <laughs> this is how I, I got to it. But like say you got a custom bike card, yes. which I assume costs a lot of money, and you don't like it or it doesn't fit right, do you redo it for free or does it cost extra? Or like what if you you know you pay all this money and then you don't right. like it? Or so to answer that, look at a couple of things. 
One, you, you have to value the fact that you understand that this is going to help you stop bone loss, it's going to stop cracks, it's going to let you save your teeth. There's a lot of things that in your particular scenario, you have to look at that and say, if, if the dentist makes that to fit in your mouth comfortably. Right, right? I'm saying it did fit. Right, but you just don't want to wear it. But it's comfortable, right? You have to make that choice. Is it worth it for you to wear it so that you can protect your mouth, protect your joint, and protect all the dentistry that's being done, right? Because that protects your, your investment. If you could say, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll wear it. Yeah, I don't like having something in my mouth, but I'll wear it, it's comfortable. Then you're going to get the benefit, right? If there's something uncomfortable, it's because it hasn't been adjusted enough. So you have to make sure you see somebody that's trained that knows how to do the adjustments. Okay, we spend a lot of time adjusting them. When I make a custom bike or it first goes to your mouth, I spend an hour adjusting it to get it to the point where it's going to do the therapy because it acts like a therapy. And for me to create that science in your mouth takes about an hour. And then after you wear it, I'm doing two adjustments after that because now your muscles are working. And I have, your muscles will react after about four nights. They'll start to change. They'll start to actually relax after four nights. So now your bike's going to change on the bike ride because your muscles have changed, right? Because your muscles move your skeleton. Right? So your teeth are going to change a little bit how you bite on them. So the, the whole point is that 99% of the population is very, very comfortable with wearing these to the point where they will run and get it as they get to wear it because they know how much better they're going to feel the next morning. And they're sleeping better. See, they're noticing it's helping them. Okay? So I don't run into a lot of problems where somebody's like, eh, I don't want this to give me my money back. But if that ever happened, and I couldn't make that work for them, or they just didn't want to wear it, then they would give me the bike card back and I would refund something. You know, I still spend time, oh, sure, you know, yeah. but yeah. we would refund something. Yeah. Okay, but this is over a short period of time. Yeah. You know, we're not like saying after two or three years. Yeah, 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 give me, give me a moment. Right? But I don't, I don't get that a lot because I'm, I am helping them, and they're getting, they're, they're, they're noticing it. They're, they're observing that they're better. In fact, one of the, one of the best. It's fun for me to help people because I, I see them actually respond. But when I, I have a gentleman, he was uh, a construction worker. Um, he was. I mean, you just look at him, you can tell he grinds his teeth. I mean, you know, big neck, jaw, muscle. I mean, his cheeks are out to here, right? And he was breaking all his teeth. So, I mean, he had to have it. Otherwise, I mean, everything's breaking. I mean, no matter what I do, it would be breaking. So, he wore the bike guard, and we're working on his teeth. And a couple of things broke, even though I worked on them. And I looked at him, and I said, are you wearing this every night? He, and at first he was, and then he was. And then he, and then he said, yeah, I'm wearing it all the time. And he said, then that wouldn't break. So he was doing a lot of clenching during the day because he's under so much stress, you know, with the type of work he has. So I said, can you wear this during the day? And he, and he tried, but it didn't really work for him. So he, yeah, every once in a while, he breaks something. And he knows that. You know, he doesn't complain. But all of a sudden, after he's been wearing it for maybe, I'd say, a year, he came in and he said, Doc, he goes, I got to tell you, I love wearing this bike ride. It has changed my life. I mean, this is a guy that would never have said, like, you know, you did a good thing, like, this was really great. I mean, it just didn't hit him. But he's wearing because, you know, he, he understands it's helping. But after a year, he's like, oh, my God. It's like, I can't, I mean, I, I will not go a night without wearing this. This is how much better I feel. And he noticed it was making him sleep better. Okay? So, I mean, it is just huge how much I get, like, information back from people of how much better they feel. Yeah. yeah. But you have to make the right kind. And you have to be able to adjust it for the problem. If this muscle's bothering you, I have to adjust it differently than if this muscle's bothering you. Okay, so you have to know how to adjust it for the problem. Yes? So do x-rays show cracks? Ah, good question. Excellent. Uh, most of the time, no. So we're not going to rely on x-rays to tell us that there's a crack. You have to visually see them, and you have to know who to look for. And, you know, like if if I take all the information I gather at your comprehensive exam, so I have models, I can look to see if you're grinding your teeth, because you'll have wear all over your teeth. If you're clenching but not grinding, I won't see it too much, but you'll probably have recession, or maybe you'll have a headache, so you'll have something. So the way it works with symptoms is that we get symptoms when it's more acute, more, uh, more uh, powerful, like the volume goes up, but chronically we probably won't notice it. So let's say, you're getting the bone loss and the recession. Maybe you have a few teeth that are cracked, but you're not getting headaches, you're not getting neck aches, you're sleeping well. It's not affecting your sleep, okay? Then you, you're not getting recession, you're getting the headaches, and you can't sleep at night, but your teeth aren't cracking. You see, not everybody gets all of it, 
But what does happen is that the further you break down, the further you go down, the more intense it becomes, the more stress we get, then the more symptoms you'll get. So you'll start to include some of the ones that you didn't have before that now, you know, like, like we said, like she has it, but you don't, then you'll get more. Okay, so down the road you'll get more. So, the, um, tell me your question again. Well, I wanted to know if an x-ray shows. Oh, the x-ray, right, okay. So, so when I'm doing a comprehensive exam, I'm, I'm getting lots of information that's gonna help me see if you're clenching or grinding through the models and through the photographs especially. So photographs, these are digital photographs of your teeth, magnified. So if you, I don't have, we don't have one here, right? So if you saw a picture of your tooth blown up, you're gonna see normal enamel, you'll see your filling, and you'll see these dark black lines going through your tooth. They stand right up. And then the tooth around the crack will turn black. And you'll be sitting there looking at it, you'll be saying, I can see it, but how come not all dentists are, are diagnosing it? because they don't know to look for it. Well, because my daughter had a crack, I think, in her tooth, and it got infected. Yes. And she sort of ignored it because it didn't hurt much. Right. And by the time she went to the dentist, and she goes every six months, right. she's very careful with her teeth, um, the dentist said, I think you gotta go to endodontist. Yes, because it was she great. She went to the endodontist, right. and he called the dentist back and said the tooth needs to be pulled. She's only 50. Right. So this is and what happens. And was uh, all around the tooth and the infection was going to the rest of the... Right. Of the so, so if you crack an egg, right, you get a little crack in it and then eventually you get your fingers in and you can open the shell. So you crack a tooth, it's like cracking the egg. It's like a crack in the sidewalk, you get water in there, it expands, right? So you get bacteria in there. But it's not deep enough for it to hurt, okay? But it's still going to progress. It's going to get bigger and bigger. Now more bacteria is going, you look at next year, it looks fine because it's getting into the middle of the tooth. It's not, it's not eating away at the outside of your enamel so I can see that in an x-ray, okay? And the x-ray only shows two areas. It doesn't show the other two. So it could be in the middle of the tooth and you're never gonna see it in an x-ray. If it's to the end where the x-ray shows, it has to be enough tooth missing for her to show up. And the x-ray x-ray shows bone loss, okay? So if the crack is there, and the bacteria is going through the crack to the middle of the tooth. It's not eating away at the outside of the tooth like a cavity, so it's not going to show up in the x-ray. So you have to detect these by knowing that your patient is a grinder or a clencher and looking for it, looking for photographs that are blown up and the models. That's the best way to find cracks. And they're obvious. They stand out a mile away. And if you get them early enough, then you can get them before they need a root canal. If the bacteria is already in the nerve, which happens a lot, then at least we caught it before they're in pain and it's abscessed. So they get to get the help and save the tooth. But what happens if that crack goes down below the gum? Is it getting too far down the root that now we're not gonna be able to save the tooth? So sometimes the surgeon has to get involved, move the gum down to see how far down does the crack go. If it goes to the bone, most likely they're gonna say take the tooth out. If it doesn't, they can move the gum down with the surgery, do the root canal, do the crown, and they're okay. Well, she had to have a tooth taken out and a bone break. Because it was too far gone. Mm -hmm. It was too much time went by and the crack just... So I said, it progresses. It just keeps going. So the bone... Can you put an implant in a place where there's a bone graft already? Yes. Well, so the, so the bad tooth had to come out. Yeah, yes. And then, then the implant and the bone graft go in. Mm -hmm. Right? So then that can grow and, and be really good. Yeah, they wait, they're waiting till the... Heals up. It heals up. Yeah, they, they do it sometimes in two stages where the bone graft goes in first, so they want the bone to, re, to regroup and to build volume. And then ask to be, you know, sometimes six to eight months, okay? And then the implant goes in, then it's another three to four months. So it can take time before they can restore the tooth. Yes? Five minutes. Five minutes left. <laughs> Anybody else have any questions? Thank you so much for coming. It was a pleasure. <laughs> Let's get the hands of your survey.